read a story this week of a of a woman that's trying to reach people in her area for the gospel, Jews for Jesus. She's with, and uh, she she went around in South Florida, and she's Jewish, Jewish background, but she's a believer in Yeshua, Jesus. And uh, so and she works with Jews for Jesus. I guess she works at the office there. And so she goes around and she sees all these gated neighborhoods. And she knew that the gates of hell shall prevail against the church. And she also knew uh, that there's a way that she's got to reach them, but she don't know how to reach them. And then the Lord laid on her heart uh, Psalm 24, where it says, Lift up your, your heads, O gates, for the Lord of glory has come. And of course, that's the gates of Jerusalem. But God really showed her something, and then God opened up the doors for her to start playing tennis again. I think she's in her late 50s. She used to, um, you know, uh, play tennis, I guess, uh, professionally or something, and then now she's had knee surgery, and now she can play again, because she couldn't play anymore for a while. So God opened the doors for her to compete in all of those gated communities. <laughs> All those gated communities were open, and now she was able to share the gospel, share about what she does, and almost everybody she plays with and plays against is Jewish. And so the Lord can open up those doors if you keep asking, seeking, and knocking. And keep asking, seeking, and knocking. Asking is between you and God. Seeking is God. You're seeking God, but then God is helping you seek things out. And knocking is actually knocking on physical doors. Like I did this week, when I, or the last two weeks, been knocking on those churches' doors to see if there are any churches that will partner with us. I was at the knocking phase. I was at the phase where I have to start knocking on those doors physically. So God showed me there's this asking, seeking, and knocking, and then the doors will be open to you. The gates will be open, and that kind of thing. So, so this week, what we're going to look at is Revelation 10. It's an interlude. It's a pause. And... On screen, we have a rendition, an artist rendition, of the mighty angel who is the focal point, or at least the symbolic focal points of this chapter. Of course, it's all about Jesus. As the ancient, ancient pastors and, and preachers would say, the whole Bible, every page, breathes of Jesus Christ. But we're talking about the real, direct revelations here of God in Revelation. And by the way, the scroll or the book of Revelation has no plural to it. It's not Revelations, although there are Revelations within the book. The Apocalypse or Apocalypse is the unveiling of Jesus. That is the unveiling of Jesus and Jesus being unveiled and unveiling the future. So we have our artist rendition. And this is a really good description of a mighty angel. Now, the, the word for mighty is powerful, but in the description, it's going to be a very large angel because one of his feet is on the sea and the other foot is on the land. So this is a very large angel. It's not like you're at the beach, you know, and you straddle, and then there's the water on one side and there's the kind of wet sand on the other side, right? It's not like that. The picture here is of a mighty, large, giant angel. Powerful. This is just one of God's angels. So to bring us up to date, what have we been learning? So the book of Revelation starts out with the church age. We look through that, first three chapters. Then the rapture and the true church in heaven, worshiping around the throne of God. Chapter 6 was an outline, an overview. It was an overview of the book of Revelation in the sense of the time when the, the tribulation uh, comes to focal point with the Antichrist rising with the man on the white horse with a bow and no arrows. And so we have that in chapter 6 and those six seals in chapter 6 leads to an interlude in chapter 7 which is about the 144,000. The 144,000 has everything to do with the gospel reaching the, the nations that the church has already reached during the gospel age, during the church age. And so what the 144,000 are doing, they are gleaning. They're getting the gleanings, the remaining, like squeezing out the last bit of juice, so to speak, out of that fruit, trying to get as much fruit as possible. 
and that's chapter 7, the 144,000. And then we took a little pause and went back to Daniel to get some keys to understand this period of time, this seven-year period of time, the tribulation. It all has to do with the last 70th week of the 70 weeks of years, and that way we have a 70th week to look at in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. And to understand that God has a tiny situation going on here. He has, he has a week of years. A week of years is seven years. And it talks about the Antichrist there, the prince who is to come, who will, um, who will cut off the sacrifice in the middle of the week. That means there's a first half and a second half of the tribulation. First half, second half. The midpoint of the tribulation, he's going to cut off. He's going to show himself as the true color. And that coincides with Revelation 11 through 14. Revelation 11, 14 is about the midpoint and then thereafter, the second half. The second half has begun. We've already had halftime. So we're kind of getting close to halftime in what we're going to look at today. Daniel, uh, I mean, Revelation 8 and 9 has to do with physical disasters, and then chapter 9, spiritual disasters that, that affect the physical. And chapter 8 and 9 gives us a foretaste of the lake of fire. Gives the world a foretaste of the lake of fire while the two witnesses are prophesying in Jerusalem for the first half of the tribulation, while the 144,000 are spreading the gospel all over the world. Spreading the gospel, God is pouring out physical and spiritual disasters to drive people to repentance at the same time. we got to get this understanding. These things are coinciding. They're at the same time. So this is what's happening in chapter 8 and 9 is to give people a foretaste of God's judgment to come. That if every element that's part of chapter 8 and 9 relates to what the eternity will be in the lake of fire. Every part of it. The rug pulled out from under you. Everything that you trust in and hope for is gone in chapter 8. Anything that you think that, that you can rely upon physically is gone. And then spiritually you're going to see these things come out and they're going to breathe fire and smoke, and you're going to have torment, and, you're, and there's going to be death, and there's going to be destruction, and all of the elements that relate to the lake of fire and eternal judgment is in chapter 8 and 9. It's a foretaste. It's like, hey, you guys want to keep going the way you are as selfish human beings, rebelling against God, and it will be that. And people will know they're rebelling against the God of creation. Here's what you have to look forward to. While the gospel is going out, it will be very easy for the 144,000 and the two witnesses to paint what God's judgment is. God's judgment is coming, therefore repent and trust in Jesus for your salvation. If you don't, this foretaste is an eternity for you. You see how that is? That's what's being painted here. And then uh, we finished up the, up the demonic uprise last week. And that was the last piece of the puzzle of God's foretaste of judgment. You had demonic uprising, part one and part two, chapter nine. And we had got a hint of who the Antichrist is, the demon or the angelic being, the fallen angelic being, who is the king over the bottomless pit, Abaddon or Apollyon. And he is the beast who comes up out of the pit. God wants us to remember this because in chapter 11 he's reintroduced he is the Antichrist. He is the prince who is to come. And of course, he will embody a human being. So this is going to be the, the like a flag, a red flag for us to see. So today, I'm going to look at Revelation 10. It's only 11 verses. Revelation 10 relates to that huge, mighty angel. So you all have your sheets in front of you. And you, can, you can read along with me. I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head, his face was like the sun, and feet like pillars on fire. He had a little book scroll in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea, and his left foot on the land, and he cried out with a loud voice, as when a lion roars, when he cried out. Seven thunders uttered their voices. Now when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write. But I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered, 
and do not write them. The angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, the sea and the things that are in it, that there should be delay no longer. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished or accomplished or completed as he declared to his servants the prophets. Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go, take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go, take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And he and the mighty angel said to me, Take and eat, and it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be sweet as honey in your mouth. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and it was sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, You must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. So that mighty angel gave him this little book or a scroll. Okay? And so what this is is like this. Every point in the book of Revelation, Jesus is giving him a little bit more information to start writing down. So as John is going through, he doesn't have the whole book in front of him. He's getting a little bit more, and a little bit more, and a little bit more. So there's a lesson there for us, right? You can hear God's Spirit speaking to you. Don't have the whole thing. It's just got, okay, now this is what you're going to do, and now you're going to prophesy a little bit more. And this mighty angel, notice how he has a rainbow hat, and uh he has a scroll in his hand. He's very huge, and he's clothed with a cloud. So it shows you how big he is. I mean, if he's a cloud level, I'm glad in this picture he's clothed with that cloud right there because it's like he's wearing pants, partially, or shorts. So let's look through. Let's unpack this a little. It may not be in, in direct order, but it's in what I call thematic or conceptual order. What's going on here? So this has to do with a pause. This has to do with clarification and objectives. God is going to let John know. John is writing this down. He's going to let him know, okay, now that we've you've experienced and seen all the way up through chapter 9, of course there's no chapters and verses there, so up to this point, now I'm going to kind of bring back to let you know what my agenda is. My agenda is to reclaim everything. Everything that has been used by Satan and sinful man. Now think about it. What is the rainbow used today for? It is definitely not used for what God intended it. God's intention for the rainbow after the flood was to remind people of God's covenant and faithfulness, a reminder of what the rainbow came from, which was the flood, which was God's judgment against sin and his promise to never flood the earth again, the entire earth. Okay? So God would be a liar if there was an entire flood again. So people have said that, well, the Noah's flood, or the flood during Noah's day, wasn't really Noah's flood. God, God, Noah didn't own it. God owned it. He was a recipient in a boat. you know. But uh, So Noah's flood, or the flood during Noah's day, if it was just a local flood, like some people purport, of certain areas, like let's say the Ararat area, then when it drained, there are lots of huge local floods all over the world. So God would be a liar. Because he said he wouldn't do that kind of flood again. Right? So you see how Satan wants to use, or the sinful man wants to use, the rainbow for their own purposes. Anything that God creates, Satan corrupts and twists, and then owns it, 
And then everybody kind of placates to it and say, oh yeah, the Rainbow Coalition, which was used by Jesse Jackson at one time, which was very perverted in certain ways of the way he talked about justice, which wasn't equal rights, it was more rights for certain um, people of ethnicity. And then you have now the rainbow used by the LGBT or LGBTQT, or depending on which alphabet suit you have this week. It's used by something else instead of it's used by uh, what God's purposes were, which was his covenant and his promises and how he is faithful. It should reflect his faithfulness, and it should reflect his mercy and grace. You think about what the rainbow represents. It was a covenant between God and the whole earth, all the animals, and all human beings. That's what it says. So you want to think somebody who is echo-friendly is God. But wait a minute, didn't he destroy everything? Yes, because of man's sin. Not because he wanted to. So that's the rainbow. How is the weather used today? You know the angel was clothed with a cloud, right? So how is climate change or global warming, or global cooling, or whatever people come up with. How is that used today? You see, it's been perverted. Climate change is what I was raised with when I was a kid. We called it weather, because the climate changes. We were in the 90s. One, one day it was 96, just a couple days ago, and then it became 72 within an hour. And that's called climate change. The climate here changed very quickly. We call it weather. See, God is going to reclaim weather. He's going to reclaim. He's the weatherman. I mean, he is the one who... Every storm that we have is an echo. Is a redundant echo reverberation. Like a, like a stone dropped in a pond in the ripple effect. From that 40 days and 40 nights storm. Every storm after that is a reverberation of that original storm. Because before then, there's no mention of those kinds of storms ever. Because there was a mist that came out of the land, and, and streams that came out of the land that watered the whole land. There were seas, there's one sea, and then the land was watered somehow. But it was there was no mention of rain prior to that. So God will reclaim weather. God's going to reclaim everything that relates to the universe. If I say universe today out there, people say evolution. People say billions, millions and billions of years. God uh, did not create the universe in millions and billions of years. I've read the Bible. He didn't do that. But evolution has pervaded in every kind of thing that is in education. Anything that relates to us looking out. And so when you read through the Psalms, it says... All the works of God are studied by all, and they are like marveling in God's creation and give glory to God, or they should give glory to God. I watched the show the other day, and it says, well, nature wouldn't have given this elephant a big brain unless it was designed to. They just elevated this ethereal thing called nature to God-like qualities. Because they said nature or evolution or whatever designed something. That is engineering design, mathematical engineering design. They're equating something that is of creation or of something out there that is ethereal with godlike qualities. And so God will reclaim all of this and say, no, look, I created the heavens and the earth and the sea and all they contain. And that's what he's doing. That's what he's showing. He is the victorious God. He is the, the uh, God who will... He is the only true and living God. And he will reclaim everything into his hand. And everybody will know it. When, when he is done with his cleanup operation, no one will doubt that he is God. He has that power. Now, the mighty angel is declaring that there will be no more delays. Now, during this pause, there is a pause. There is a pause at the end here before the next phase, before the trumpet blasts, because he says, whence the seventh angel blasts, woe unto the earth. There's going to be the next series. We had 
seven seals. The seventh seal opened up the seven trumpets. And the seventh trumpet will open the seven vials or bowls of wrath. And so it's getting worse every time. And so it could trick those who dwell upon the earth, those who think that this fantasy that they have of life is going to get back to normal. You know, after every storm, after every hurricane, we will rebuild. We'll do, you know, just like every time, we'll just rebuild. We'll go. Where is the national repentance? Where is the, what have we done? Have we done anything to deserve this? You know, there, that should be the first response. God, instead of us, we will rebuild. Because that will be the normal tendency of mankind. And this will coalesce the Antichrist saying, we will rebuild after these natural disasters. And he will rally together the whole world, and they'll be, yeah, that's right. And he has the answer or something. There'll be something in whatever he says. We're not given privy of everything. We're not privy of that. But we are knowing that God says, there'll be no more delay. Once that seventh trumpet happens, there will be the cleanup operation. It will be on steroids. And the second half of the tribulation will seem quicker than the first one. But those who are going through it may seem longer because they're going through it. But it will still be the same amount of time, three and a half years. But there's going to be so much poured on. You thought the first half was bad. Wait till we get to the second half. And that's what this is saying. This chapter 10 is saying, wait till you get to the second half. Now, what about those seven thunders? And the seven thunders uttered their voices. And John says, I'm about to write. And then a voice says, seal it up. Seal it up and do not write it. Now, seal it up and do not write it. Which is it? Seal it up or do not write it? Interesting. Basically, it's saying, don't let anybody else know. You've heard it. You don't tell anybody else. Now, in the military, they have those kinds of things. They swear an oath, and they're not supposed to do that. In CIA and other kinds of operations like that, agencies, you can't divulge this information, or it will mess things up. Now, I don't know how that will mess things up, but there, here's the answer to the question of why. Why is God saying, don't write this down? Why is it? Well, there are some things because of God's sovereignty. He has the right to say no. Back in World War II, loose lips sink ships. I don't know if it's that. But I do know this, that we still have to trust him, even though we don't have all the information. John had all the information. He heard them. I don't know if God erased that from his memory when he got back down to earth. You know, after these visions, but I'll tell you one thing. Regardless, we don't have to know all the information. There is there is a lesson here, and we'll, we'll readdress this again. Want to unpack some more? The mystery of God is finished. When he mentions this, and the mystery of God will be finished means it will be accomplished when the seventh trumpet blast happens. When that seventh trumpet happens, then the seven bowls of wrath will start going. From chapter about 11 onward, 11 through 19, 11 through 20, is what he's talking about. He's talking about the end times prophecy being fulfilled. He's talking about uh, the, the day of the Lord, those last seven years, the messianic age, bringing in the messianic age of God. He's talking about the great tribulation at 70th week. That's what he's talking about here. He's talking that the mystery of God will be finished because it has been a mystery of how God is going to accomplish all this for thousands of years. How is God going to finish up his story? Future. To finish everything up and bring in the Messiah, this future quote-unquote David, who will sit upon David's throne and reign for a thousand years or forever, really, over Israel. There are fulfillments yet to be fulfilled, prophecies to be fulfilled, that God is 
obliged to buy his own covenant for Israel. This does relate to Israel, but the impact of God's promises being fulfilled to Israel will affect the whole world. That's called the millennium. So this is what he's talking about here. It will be fulfilled, that which was declared to the ancient prophets. We looked into some of those, and we're going to look into a lot more in the Old Testament to see how God has been saying these things over and over again and how the book of Revelation kind of puts it into a framework. Very symbolic. A lot of symbolism is used. But it puts it into a framework of how things are going to progress as time goes on during that seven years. Now remember, we're looking at just a few chapters. Now you turn a chapter, and, it, and you have one thing where it says five months, so it talks about that. We don't know how long it is until the second part of chapter 9 happens, where these other demons who were under the Euphrates come up in the 200 million. We don't know how many months after that happens. What we know is part of the first half of the tribulation. That first half is three and a half years. That's a long time. But it's also a short time. But as you go day by day, hour by hour, it's a long time. So some things are going to happen toward the end. Something's going to happen in the middle of that period of time. But during that whole time, the 144,000 are out proclaiming the gospel, bringing people to Christ. And remember, it says, a multitude which no man could number, who came out of the tribulation. So we know that their ministry was within the tribulation period of time. So we know that they're going to have a ministry. The two witnesses, and God's ministry is the you know, direct ministry is to pour out those physical disasters and release things out of the pits or bound underneath rivers. He's, uh, he's doing multi-pronged attacks to attack man's pride. It's all about man's pride. Because we know Babylon is mentioned later on, and Babylon is the epitome of man's pride because of the tower of Babylon we shall make a name for ourselves. It was pride in our community? No, it was pride in ourselves, pride in humanity. Selfish, boastful, pride we don't need God, humanism. It is. It is, we can do it. So that's what the mystery is. The, the, the finishing up. The scroll that is in the hand of the mighty angel. The scroll that's in the hand of the mighty angel. I'm going to read from Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 3. And he said to me, Son of man, feed your belly and fill your stomach with this scroll. This is Ezekiel 3, verse 3. It's really Ezekiel chapter 2, all the way up through verse 3 of chapter 3 of Ezekiel. That is a parallel with what John going through here. And he said to me, Son of man, Son of man being Ezekiel, feed your belly and fill your stomach and with this scroll that I give you. So I ate and it was in my mouth like honey with sweetness. So remember I said almost everything in the book of Revelation has some link point, connection point that gives you an idea of what's going on uh, in, a, in a deeper way. It's like I'm pointing to different things, and I want you to go back and study this. So you can get, understand what then is going on here. At this point in time, it relates in, a, in the same way. So just like Ezekiel was tasked to eat the scroll, sweetness, it doesn't say it was bitter to his stomach, no. But what he was going to be doing was very bitter. It might have made him sick to his stomach. If he had to go to the northern ten tribes, to the, the rebellious house of Israel, and he had to go prophesy over them, doom and destruction, that eventuated in 721 B.C. when um, the kingdom or empire of Assyria, Assyria, came down and took them away. Ninety-something percent, 98 percent of the people of the northern ten tribes were taken away, and that empire replaced all those people with various other peoples that came in, and those eventually became the Samaritans. There's no Israeli genetics in those people. The Israelis are different, and these people are different, and the Bible makes it very clear 
they have no connection. That's why they were foreigners to the Israeli during the time of Jesus. It says the Samaritans. Oh, and they had a corrupt version of religion, too. And you can read about that in 2 Kings chapter 16 through 19. So what is this about? You must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. So John, instead of having to go to the northern ten tribes and prophesy over Israel, here he's talking to many people. He didn't say all peoples, nations, tongues, and tribes. He said many. So what he's talking about here is chapters 11 through 19, or 11 through 20, but what is going to go on between that time. That little scroll is about what's going to happen now. All the rest of this has to do with the rest of the book of Revelation up to about 20. Okay? Does that make sense? So he's given a, given this scroll and he's going to talk about many peoples. It's specific people groups that relate to their footprint on Jerusalem. And we know what those people groups are today because they are Muslim. That is, people groups that are under the dom domination of Islam. Because it's going to talk about in chapter 11, we'll talk about that next week, that there's a footprint of the nations on Jerusalem. And they only have another 42 months left of that footprint. And that footprint is talked about in by Jesus in chapters 24 and 25 of Matthew. And times of the Gentiles are talked about in Romans 11 by Paul. It all relates to how long the footprint will be on top of the Temple Mount. Temple Mount. Well, who is on the Temple Mount that day? The feet of the Gentiles. Which Gentiles? Specifically. And that's, what, that's why it isn't all. It's many. Many people groups. Well, there are many people groups that are related to that, with that footprint. Again, Euphrates River is talked about twice. God is giving us hints. Clues. He's dropping us big clues here. And so that's what he's talking about here. What people groups will be all the Gentiles of this many that relate to the footprint? All of those that are related to the footprint. It isn't all the Gentiles of the world that are going to be affected and controlled by the Antichrist fully. That this kingdom falls apart, Daniel 11. The kingdom falls apart. Gentiles say, we don't like this guy anymore. There is a point at which they don't like him anymore. So we know for a fact he's talking about a specific amount of people groups. So Isaiah 63 and Psalm 83 give you a hint of, a, of the clue. Isaiah 63, Psalm 83. So why is he doing this? Well, he wants us to know that God is going to accomplish. He is going to accomplish. So here are the lessons we can learn. God is a mighty God. He is a mighty conqueror. He is El Gabor. That's one of the names that is used to prophesy about Jesus. Unto, a son, unto us a son is born, unto us a child is given, and his name shall be, and the government shall rest upon him, and all that. Well, one of the names, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Okay? That mighty God is El Gabor. Only used of Yahweh God and Jehovah God in the Old Testament. Prophesied of the Son who will be given. Who has a name or a title only God can have. El Gabor. And he is a mighty God. And he will use mighty signs, wonders, and miracles of power to accomplish the reclama reclamation of the universe. And he will display his power. When was the last time he did that? Egypt. When he displayed himself against Pharaoh to set the captives free. So he's going to do the same kinds of things. We're going to see a repetition of some of the things. Some of the things have already been mentioned. Hail. Fire like lightning. Right? Because lightning in the sky would be like fire in the sky. Smoke. Blood in the water. All of those kinds of things were also mentioned, and they're going to be mentioned again. Frogs are going to be mentioned again. 
It's all of those kinds of things that relate to God displaying his power. And it does go back to some of the things that he did in setting the Egyptians free. In this case, God is even using Satan. Did God use Pharaoh? God used Pharaoh, didn't he? God used all of those things to display his power. To display his power. Because when we see his power, there's nothing left for us. Now there will be some people who regardless of that power will still be rebellious. And then God will have to judge. God's hope, though, is always repentance, right? He wants people to come and know him. Now, he opened up this chapter with a mighty angel. One foot on the land, one foot on the sea. God has a lot of angels with him. Remember I told you that these multidimensional beings, these spiritual multidimensional beings, they can change shape. They can get bigger and you know, they, they can do this. Well, God's holy angels have God's holy power. And remember, Michael and Gabriel, they have two-thirds of the angels. Just by angel power, they can beat Satan. They can whip his butt. Just by that. But think about it. These are mighty angels. God displays just one angel. Just one mighty angel. God has a lot of those mighty angels. Who is, who is like unto our God? And look at the host. He is <laughs> Yahweh Tzabaoth. <laughs> Yahweh Tzabaoth, or the Lord of hosts, which means Yahweh of armies, of heaven's army. It's Yahweh and his heaven arm, heaven, heavenly army. Who can stand against him? Because the whole world will look at the Antichrist and say, who can stand against the Antichrist? Oh, look at him, how powerful he is. Oh no, look at Yahweh God. Look how powerful he is. He is El Gabor. Amen? And that's what he's showing here. Just one of his angels. Think of the countless angels he has. I don't even know how many they have. I mean, there's a definite number. But it's twice as much as what Satan has. Satan is all full of bluster and intimidation and he thinks somehow in his pride he can win. I don't know how he can win. I am glad we're on the winning side, amen? The seven thunders that peal. What is a lesson we can learn here? Well, we need to trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not on our own understanding. In all our ways we need to acknowledge him and he will direct our paths. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. We need to trust him. Most of the time, God does not give us all of the information. Sometimes the information is sealed until a certain time. And we all need, I need, Andy needs to learn this. I, I'm still learning this. That God doesn't show us everything. I personally like to have the information because then I can use that information to complete a task. Or to go and do something. I like information because I like to tell others. I like to help others by telling them. And sometimes I tell too much, or whatever. You know, your, your gift sometimes can be your curse, right? And so it has to be trusting in him, relying upon him. God does not want us to rest on our world. That's not what he's saying. But he's saying, if you don't know about it, don't, don't worry about it. Just trust in him. Rely upon him. Another word for trust is to rest. Trust, rely upon, and rest in him. We don't know what the future holds, all of it. He's given us some picture of it. We don't have the granular, personal information of our future, every little part of it. But God does. And we know, his, we know that he holds the future. He's giving us a taste of it in, in the book of Revelation. That's why it says it's a blessing for us to read it and to do that which is in it. Revelation 1, verse 3. It's a blessing for us to know that we need to trust in him. And there are some times that God does not want us to know certain things. And it might be the best thing for us not to know it. In fact, it is the best thing, because God says so. And if God says so, I trust him. 
Rely upon him and enjoy him and the life he's given you and the people around you. See, that's what he's saying here. You know, it's nice to know. Those seven peals of thunder, very intriguing. Oh, I wish I knew. Maybe John put that in the back pocket and it's buried in this treasure chest and it's on the island of Patmos. So people will spend millions of dollars to go try to find out what's in those seven thunder because, because if I can get that information, it will solve what? Who knows what it will solve? But I might be able to sell it for a million dollars. You know how it is. <coughs> These treasure people. Okay, so what about that scroll? That scroll that was sweet to the mouth or sweet here, but when it got down, it made him sick to his stomach bitter. I want you to think through. It's like end times prophecy. It's like the Word of God sometimes. You go through the Word of God. You go through, and, and you say, Wow, this is so good. I'm learning things. I'm connecting things. It's making sense. Oh, wow. It's like it's like candy to my brain, candy to my mind. And, and then all of a sudden it sinks in and you go, oh, the implications are. The impact is. And then we think, oh, wow. That's the bitterness that he's talking about here. The sweetness is it's God, and it's God's word, and I'm learning, and I'm growing, and this is great, and God's faithfulness, God's faithfulness is his word, and it gets me closer to him, I get to understand his mind, the way he is, you know, you get to know God, you get to know his ways, how he is, that's just the way God is, you know, that friend that you know, you get to know that person because you get familiar with their ways, and how they are, and you can relax, and it's familiar, you that family, that's where that comes from. In the same way, that's sweet. It's delicious. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good, right? But then the impact of that prophecy of chapters 11 through 20, including the lake of fire, that's bitter to the soul. And that's what he's talking about here. Talking about the bitterness. So what are some of those things that would make you sick in your stomach? Just some. This is a highlight of some. Why so many people who've heard the gospel did not come to faith before the rapture? That 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 makes you sick to your stomach. Especially in a world now where you have so much communication. And every people group on the planet has access almost now to the international web, you know, the, the internet. Almost all of them do now, in some way, shape, or form. Almost every people group around the world has a tra at least a trade language that they know. Maybe not their heart language, but at least a trade language that they know. That now that they can go and get a Bible in a trade language, at least a language that they can know, and they can learn the Word of God. The access is unbelievable now, more than at any time in since the day of Pentecost for the gospel. It doesn't mean that every people, nation, kind and tribe has been reached with the gospel, but the access is there. Matthew 24, 14 is almost completely fulfilled now. Whereas this gospel of the kingdom shall be proclaimed as a witness, all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end shall come. And, and so this gospel of the kingdom, the king, that Jesus is king, uh, almost is everywhere. Okay? And why is it that so many people are still rejecting it? It's hard for us to even fathom, and it makes us sick. Why so many people will still refuse to repent during the first half of the tribulation? Remember the last few verses of chapter 9, just be before we come to this chapter. And the rest refuse to repent of their sin. And they give a list of all their sins. Why? Why? Why, are, why will so many people follow the Antichrist? Even in the midst of all of this, where God does all of these things, why? Why? And so that makes, I, I, can't, even, I can't even imagine what John is thinking. Because he had spent so long with Jesus and has 
for those many years, has spent so long witnessing about Jesus to others and, and telling and proclaiming, being a witness, a testimony, and, and probably seeing many people coming to Christ. Of course, many did not. But And the martyrdom. When he's looking through this, he has not seen that kind of martyrdom. There is some martyrdom during that Smyrna period of time. We talked about the ten waves of persecution during church history. That hadn't really fully taken effect during all of his life yet. One wave has come through, it wasn't as bad, but progressively it will get worse. But this martyrdom that's talked about in the book of Revelation is beyond measure of how many Christians will be slaughtered during the tribulation by the Antichrist. That right there would make him sick to his son. Just seeing that. But knowing that they're going to heaven, but still, they're being tortured, they're persecuted. We've seen some of that now because of ISIS. ISIS as as if they are the people who are waiting for the beast to come out of the pit. They talk about that. They are, they are the caliphate, they say. And they are the end times embodiment of what their mock beast will do for seven years. They talk about this stuff. What the people don't understand that we are seeing right now, the coalitions of things going on of various people groups. These are people of various people groups, of various nations. They're coming together to be the Catholic. And that's exactly what the empire of the Antichrist is going to look like. But it's going to be huge. We're seeing the seed, just the seed of it. We ain't seen nothing yet. This is what the Antichrist regime will look like. And then the lake of fire. Why so many people refuse to repent all the way up until the lake of fire? That includes during the millennium. That includes that during that thousand years there will be people who have not fully surrendered to Jesus Christ personally and taken Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior during that thousand years. Because they will when Satan is released out of the bottomless pit, will go along and listen to him and coalesce and have a huge rebellion against God. It says so in chapter 20. So at the end of that thousand years, there will be another rebellion. And so why is it that during that whole time when Jesus was still here, and it's almost like paradise, not completely, but almost like paradise on earth, Environment, you know, all the people that complain about, well, if the environment was better, or my conditions or my circumstances were better, well, no one will have an excuse then. It's only going to be political or something. They don't like Jesus being, you know, ruling the, the nations with a rod of iron, like Psalm 2 says. He's going to rule the nation. nations with a rod of iron. There'll be justice. There'll be no crime. He'll nip it in the bud. There'll be nothing like that. So externally, people will reverence him as king, but there are many who do not reverence him internally and have bowed the knee internally to him as king, lord, god, and master in their lives as savior. They still need forgiveness of sin. They are still inheritors of Adam's curse. And so we we are just like John. And like, why? Why is it that in every kind of circumstance man has been from Adam to the end of the millennium. Every kind of circumstance that you can think of, man still has an excuse somehow. That no, I didn't want to follow you because there will be a day when that happens. And that makes us sin to our stomach. So these are things, I think, that, that make make John sick, makes me sick to myself, makes me bitter. I love end times prophecy. But this part makes me sick. And that's the real message of this chapter. You're going to prophesy, but you're going to hate it. You're going to be sick. But you just got to go through it and do it. And I'm so happy that he wrote it down. I'm so happy he was obedient in it. So on a, on a lighter note, just to give you more information here, and to kind of sum everything up, Revelation 8 through 11 is kind of like one, one continuous thought. Revelation 8 through 11 is like one continuous chapter. So I would love for y'all to go back through and read through 
Revelation 8 through 11, and see all the connections and the progression of what's going on. Because once you get to chapter 12 and onward, we are in the second half of the tribulation. The midpoint of the tribulation really occurs when the enemy, through the Antichrist, the beast that rises out of the pit, kills the two witnesses. That's the midpoint. That right there that says, okay, half time's over. Boom. Second half begins. Because the Antichrist really will show his true colors and will be, quote unquote, a mighty conqueror. One on a white horse with a bow and no arrows. And he will show himself to who he truly is. We're going to see the rebuilt temple, two witnesses. And uh, so it gets exciting in the sense of, wow, that's sweet to my taste. But it is also bitter. All of this is to help us so that we will be able to better prepare to help people come to know Jesus. It is not just to satisfy our intellectual curiosity. This is for God to equip us to worship him, to serve him. What's the summation of the New Testament? Salvation, forgiveness, sound doctrine, and church health. Right? So evangelism and missions, sound doctrine and church health. Evangelism and missions, sound doctrine and church health. It isn't, I'm going to change everything in the world. Here, it's not cleaning up the aquarium. It's getting the fish ready for when the rapture occurs, so to speak. We are, as a body of Christ, as Christians, we are here for evangelism and missions and having, holding to sound doctrine and building up and encourage each other so that we can evangelize. That makes sense. We're asking God to fill us with His Spirit, not so that I can have a high, not so I have a good feeling. It's so that I can be equipped and empowered to be able to be a witness for Him, to be a mighty conqueror, a warrior for Christ, until that day that He calls us home. Humble warriors for Christ, Amen. Because we worship, we worship a mighty God. We worship a God who is the mighty conqueror. God Almighty, thank you, God, for your mercy. Thank you, God, for your for your love. Thank you, God, for your forgiveness, so that we can go set the captives free, so they can experience His love, mercy, and grace, and forgiveness, so that we can equip them to set the captives free from so on. That's the New Testament. Amen.